Um, Allah bless all of you and give it to a faith in all that you do. Um, she said the solution is is um, in the house. So in the corporate world they say 8% of success is being there. And then you build on the 92%. So just being there together, um, there is a tawfiq of success in our religion as well. Um, in pursuit of knowledge, like seeking knowledge, one of the things that's central in the our religion is, is knowledge because of the first revelation. Uh, the first revelation, Iqra, is, is really one of the most beautiful uh, part of the Quran. But it's not just the Iqra part, it's what happens next. So Iqra, Bismillah Ladi Khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who has created you. Now, that brings back. Uh, the reader back to the intention, why we are reading. And this is one of the things that uh, when uh, a couple of weeks ago, Sheikh Hamza talked about this concept of mindfulness. And a lot of the people in the West, they're, they're doing mindfulness. But mindfulness of what? What are we being mindful of? When people are doing yoga, what are they mindful of? Like is So if you don't have Bismillah, if you don't read with the name of Allah who has created you, then you're really mindful of your nafs. You're really doing everything for yourself, for your ego, for your desires. But this, for us, seeking knowledge, talabul ilm faridatun ala kulli muslim, that it's, uh, it's an obligation for every Muslim to seek knowledge. Now, if we look at the Prophet's life, he said, Ya Allah, don't make the sun go down on the day that I don't learn something. And here's a man who has more knowledge than any human being that ever lived, right? He has more knowledge, he has, he, revelation comes to him, but he wants to learn more. Because through learning, you get closer to your Lord. So, That we have not created the human being in the jinn except to worship us. What the scholars of Quran, they say, including Ibn Abbas, is لِيَعْبُدُونَ is لِيَعْرَفُونَ that we have not created the jinn in the human being except to know us. And you know something through having the knowledge of that, right? So this is why the foundation of our religion is first thing you have to know is Allah and then yourself. Like these two is, is foundational. So how do you get to know yourself or Allah if you don't go on the path of seeking knowledge? And the path of seeking knowledge, Imam Malik said, knowledge does not go after anybody. You have to go after it. You have to go seek out. And this is why in our tradition, when you look at Sa'di Shirazi, when you look at uh, Imam Al-Ghazali, when you look at every scholar that you look at, they traveled and they went from land to land, even in the modern day. Look at all these people, the scholars that we have in the West. They went from here to Damascus to study. You know, converts from America went and studied years in, in Mauritania and years in Damascus and years in Yemen. And the worst of condition. The worst of condition. Why? Because you have to go after knowledge. Because knowledge is not going to come after anybody. So, knowing is foundational to our religion. Because it is through knowing that you will always have this newness. Because things can get stale and become all same old, same old. But, you know, what they, what they say is only a philosopher and a child is always in the state of discovery. And that discovery is going to give you, is through knowledge. Discovery doesn't just happen when you discover things. It is through reading and through understanding and through it's, it's calling people and asking, what does this mean? What does this mean? And then, boom, it opens up. In that moment that something opens up, you understand what is a hadith. What is a verse of the Quran? It's a wisdom piece. It's a poem. Whatever it is, that is the moment of ecstasy of the mind. So the, your mind feels like this way. They say in the, in the Western uh, civilization, they call it the light bulb. They say the light bulb went up, right? And that is for us, that is the light. It is a uh, ilm, nur. Knowledge is light. And that's when knowledge you actually, because Information is knowledge scattered. That's all it is. There's knowledge in the internet, but it's all scattered. 
Knowledge is when they become monsajim, they become one. That's knowledge. If everything is brought together, it's like you have a you have a puzzle and all of the pieces on the on the table. That's information. That's not knowledge. Once you put it together and you have the picture, that it becomes knowledge. And a lot of the people, they actually don't know how to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And that's the biggest problem that we have today is there's so much information out there that people are confused. And this is one of the tradition towards the end of time. People will be confused. And why is there confusion? Because there's just massive amount of information and not enough knowledge. Not enough people have put the big picture together so you can see what's going on. So foundational to our religion is to seek knowledge. Now, why Ilm is so high? Why is Ilm so high? The Quran reminds us, you know, uh, are those, I think there's a slide here, yeah, in Surah 39.9. So are those who know, and those who don't know, they're equal, right? This is, uh, this is a rhetorical question. That's why Allah doesn't answer it, because it's, the answer is in it, right? Are those you know? Are they the same? No, of course they're not the same. So, the, Allah says, I have increased in rank those who have granted knowledge. So, the Prophet وسلم, said, the preference of alim over a regular worshiper. Now, you have to understand that the regular worshiper is a believer. It's a person of paradise. But it's a, he worships Allah, she worships Allah five times a day, prays, fasts in Ramadan. It's a, it's a worshiper. It's, he's not comparing an alim to someone, to a kafir. No, to a, 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 a Muslim. An, an Abid. He said, is that the preference of the moon to the star. This is an amazing analogy because here's the difference. Both the moon and the star, they give their light from the sun. Both of them. But the moon gives light back to the earth. Right? So we can see our path. And then when it's full moon, you can actually see the. You can actually read if you're in a nice place. With, with, the, with the light of the moon it gives back. Yet the stars, they keep the light for themselves. So an alim, you know, an alim is someone who not only benefits himself with the light, but benefits other people that are around him. So this is the beauty of becoming someone of knowledge. So ilm is foundation of the Quran and the Hadith in our tradition. And there's not a place that you uh, that you can come across and that the alim is not there. Now, before we go to that, there are reasons why people study, right? But, I think there's a slide at the end of it, but mm -hmm. I'm just going to go through this. There's a, there's a, the purpose of knowledge, right? This is my thing, right? Or, yeah. Yeah, you can, you can go on. I'll I'll go to your slide. I just okay. You can go to the slide. Yeah, yeah. You can go ahead. It's okay. Yeah. Let me just do mine, and then you can do yours. Yeah. Okay? There we go. Okay. So. So. The habits. So here we are in this. I want to be in the same slide. Okay. Knowledge. People they learn for one of these three reasons. Either you learn for the sake of Allah. For the sake of dunya or for the sake of your nafs. That's it. Those are the three reasons that people learn. Whatever you do in your life, that's the three reasons. There's not a fourth category. So, the first hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the first hadith in Imam Nawawi's Arba'in, the first hadith that many of the scholars of hadith put on as the first hadith is إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالِ بِالْنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ إِبْنِ مَا نَبَرَ so this hadith talks about something really beautiful that your actions are rewarded by your intention right and everyone will get what they have intended now here's here's the, the people don't know what happened in that hadith why did the Prophet said this hadith then he said if you make hijrah for Allah and his messenger your hijrah for, is for Allah and his messenger 
But if you made hijrah for dunya, وَيُنْجِحُهَا Or for nikah, to get married, then your hijrah, your migration, is for that thing that you intended. This is about a man who was in love with this woman from Qais. And he wanted to make hijrah to get married with Qais. So when he got there, I said, is his hijrah accepted? He didn't go for the sake of Allah. He went to get married and did the nikah with Qais. And that's why the ulama, they say, had he made the intention that I'm going to make hijrah for the sake of Allah and I'm going to get married, his hijrah would have been accepted and his marriage is valid, right? Obviously his marriage is valid, but the hijrah wasn't for Allah, it was for Um Qais. It's famous as hijrah Um Qais, the migration for this woman. So, that's the key that everything has to be done for Allah. In this society, when you would see uh, you know, in, in there, there was an ad that Sheikh told us one time um, about, I think, the University of Arizona says uh, uh, for higher education, and they spelled higher H I R E. And I think they did it purposely. Like, hey, you want to get a job when you finish your university and get, make some money? Come here. And the majority of the people, the young people now, and it's very hard to get that out of their head. Even, you know, with my own family, young people, I'm like, don't study for money. Don't study a field that makes money. Study a field that will make you happy. What would you like to do? You know, so that's a big problem that we have. That generally young people, they want dunya. How much money is this field going to make? How much am I going to make? How much am I going to make? So then the other field, the other reason is the nafs, right? So I want to become, you know, you know, just to show my uncle, da, 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 I'm going to become a, a doctor. So it's just they do it for their nafs. Or that I could be respected, that I could be a judge, that I could be this. So it's either the ego, the nafs desires, or it's the dunya, or it's for the sake of Allah. So that is the hardest part to teach young children from a young age that listen, learn for the sake of Allah. Get a job that makes you happy. What makes you happy? Like when my son he said he wants to do this, he wants to go into this field, I said, why? He said, uh, uh, it's helping people and I like helping people. I said, go. And it's not a job that makes a lot of money and it's, it's a long time. That you, I mean, they said you can do, I didn't say, hey, you can do something else and make more money. No, he likes it. He, and the intention was pure that he wants to help people. And may Allah keep that intention always. And I said, go for it. But there are people that, I counsel and they say, no, 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 I want to do this. I hate it, but I want to do it because it makes a lot of money. And that is what the problem is, that it's solely dunya. If you put Allah first, then you want to do things that Allah is pleased with. Allah is pleased with helping people. Allah is pleased with this job. Even if it makes money or it doesn't make money, it, that's irrelevant. But you put God first and you're seeking knowledge in, in, uh, in that. So now... Um, let me go back to these. I think this was, I was supposed to do this. Okay. This one, right? Okay. So, beneficial habits. Bismillah. So, thank you, Mary John, for doing this. I didn't do this. She was, she was <laughs> going by this. That's why I'm just falling. You know, um, that's, uh, anyways. I have a proverb. I didn't use it because it's, uh, I would look really bad in that. <laughs> Uh, Actually, if you don't mind, let me go through my my section, and okay. then you can do this one because sure. it kind of flows. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I designed it well. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, if we go to the, this slide, which we were looking at earlier, yeah. So, oftentimes, and this is this is um, the theme of our school, which is you know, truth, or you know, goodness and beauty. And I'm sure you guys have heard these terms. Your, student, your children might have come in and said, well, Lord, we're trying to learn what is truth, what is goodness, what's beauty. And so, so when we're seeking knowledge, one of the things that I told the students and the teachers is when Harvard, for example, was first founded, there were no majors, right? The only major that they had was the answers to these questions. What is truth? What is goodness? And what is beauty? And how do we define it? And just answering these questions meant that 
you could spend your whole life in a meaningful, meaningful purpose, right? Because if you're in search of the truth, you're going to understand that all truth comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from God, right? That all truth comes through revelation. That all truth manifests in Allah's creation, right? So like today, for example, we might have, you know, this non-binary, like we can be man, we can be a woman. And then there was a man who said, well, if somebody dies and they're buried and their bones are pulled out and, and you look at their DNA, that DNA is not going to lie. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the truth that Allah SWT created. And so we want to make sure that we, we manifest these transcend, transcendental values, that our students know clearly what it means to be good. Because as I was telling Seth Redun earlier in our conversation, in today's society, vices are virtues, and virtues are vices, right? If you are honest, if you are noble, if you're trying to pursue certain character traits in yourself that mean that you are going to be ben of benefit, right? It's looked at as like something negative. Like for example, um, if someone comes in and says, I want to, you know, uh, open up a business that's going to help the, the poor in some way or, or do something like that, many of the people will say, well, how are you going to make a living out of this? This is not going to be a benefit to you personally, right? Catering to the nafs of our children and ourselves as well, because obviously we worry. But, but in, in, in reality, if the priorities are kind of shifted and we understand that we want our children to obviously succeed in this dunya, but we want them to succeed through virtuous, virtuous acts. And like as I said, just said, with the intention of actually serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being of benefit, right? So making that core intention. When our children enter kindergarten, it's true. We want them to receive an education. We want them to become something, uh, you know, profound and beneficial. But we can make this intention that we want them to tread on the path of Allah, right? In that way, if the outcome is that they become a doctor, a lawyer, a successful business person, a, you know, whatever, whatever field that they go into, then that is of benefit, like the hadith that he just mentioned of making hijra for the sake of, um, for the sake of marriage or for the sake of, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So as parents kind of cultivating and understanding these, and ourselves being able to define within our own words, using our own faculties to say, what is truth? What does that mean? And how do I define it? And how can I define it to my children so that they understand when they come with a fact that's you know, given to them at high school or university or something like that, that I can manifest and provide the source for them and, and the reason for them to go back to that source. Same thing with beauty. Like, we have a very skewed perspective of beauty in today's society. Whether it's in architect, architecture, whether it's in art, whether it's in the way that we construct things, whether it's the materials that we use for different types of things, right? It's all about the aesthetics of what we value and what we find valuable. And so if we are okay with like absorbing things that are not biodegradable, absorbing things that are not um, not only not pleasing to Allah, but destructive to the earth, right? We are, in a way, contributing to that lack of beauty, right? Uh, one of the things I remember Shah Hamza saying is, truth is Iman, right? When you when you manifest and understand that sense of um, <coughs> that Allah is one and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, is uh, his messenger, and then you go into, like, and then goodness is the practice of your Islam. So it's all of the outer actions that you do, your prayer, your salah, your... Uh, being kind to your neighbors, all these outer actions. And then if you have those two things, your actions automatically equal to ihsan, which is beauty. So everything that you do and everything that you produce and everything that you're able to create and everything that you think about, your thoughts, right? And your, your being becomes beautiful regardless of your physical appearance, right? So let's go on to the next slide. So let's go through these. Inshallah, and I know most of us know this because we experience this, but I'm going to go through these uh, points really quickly because I feel like in order for us to be in the place of understanding the solutions, we should understand some of the ailments that we're dealing with. So like some of the things that we see as a, in a school that are impacting children to a great extent 
are things like family changes, right? And I mean, I think to Seth Fedun, because he's a community organizer, because he deals with uh, conflicts within families, can probably attest to this, that our family structures have quite significantly changed. You know, and this is not about whether, you know, we're single family homes or, you know, both parent homes, but the dynamics of the household, of multi-generational homes, of roles within the homes, of, of all of the different aspects of things that we kind of looked at um, traditionally have altered, right? And so that in and of itself has a huge impact on the way that we're bringing up our children and on the way that we as parents are also feeling, right? Um, another major aspect, a lot of times people will say technology is the problem. I, I don't think technology in and of itself is an issue. Like a computer is not an issue, a robot's not an issue, a phone's not an issue. It's more what we do with it. And so I would really identify that being on social media is a big issue, right? Being on these time kind of consuming, and I know we had this conversation <laughs> recently, time consuming uh, apps which, you know, were kind of scrolling mindlessly. I spoke to a teenager a couple of months ago where, you know, she's failing her classes, she's failing her university, she keeps dropping classes, she's been at university for, actually she wasn't a teenager, probably in mid-20s, mid but um, she's been at university for many years and is not graduating and her mom asked me to talk to her. When I did, I, I found out that she was spending close to six to eight hours a day on TikTok. You know, and, and it's just this mindless scrolling, right? So that's definitely an issue. TV and movies, I mean, before social media and handheld devices, these used to be a big issue. Like we talked about consumption of television. So now we're like, let us go back to the days of television. We all sat down in front of the TV and watched something. Uh, but movies, TV and movies, obviously amusing ourselves to death. But more importantly, nowadays, it's content issues, too. It's reframing of our thinking around what's good, what's true, what's beautiful. Being busy, this culture of like missing out on things, right? We are all a product of that. And that's why like Scole is one of our big, uh, big uh, incentives for creating ad contests. Scole is actually, it, it means leisure in Latin, which is the word that we get school from. So it's, it's the concept of leisurely learning. When you're in a state of leisure, when you're in a state where you're not in a flight or flight mode, that's when your brain is the most receptive towards learning. And so it's very important for us to understand as parents that when we're keeping our kids so busy, when we're scheduling them for this class and that class and going from this thing to that thing, and we never have that sense of rest, right, that we're, our, it's not benefiting us or them. And then, being very outer focused as a society, like focused on appearances and focused on clothing and focused on like the things that are, um, you know, uh, like the kind of car that we drive and the kind of uh, jewelry that we have, etc. Or even the kind of restructuring we're, <laughs> we're going to do to our bodies, right, versus what's inside of us and really understanding uh, that concept. And then reward systems. Um, so doing everything for the sake of rewards. So like for example, I have to do this assignment so that I can get an A. Um, I have to do this uh, you know, job because this is what's gonna pay me. I have to do this and I have to do that. So this mentality of like, I'm constantly getting rewarded and expecting a reward for the things that I should be doing versus I'm just doing this because Wisdom is something that's going to elevate my, my status with Allah SWT and, Tala, and wisdom is the thing that's going to elevate my status with people as well because we all know that at the end of the day no matter what profession you might have if you're not a person of wisdom there's not going to be much respect within that, uh, within that system for you. So with that said I do want to make just one point. Many of us grew up in, uh, in societies where we weren't exposed to some of the things that our kids are kind of exposed to, especially when it comes to like literature, poetry, you know, under reading certain kinds of uh, texts, right? Uh, we didn't grow up reading, for example, the books, the classic literature books that our, our children are going to be reading. So oftentimes we have a really hard time connecting with them on those stories, right? And those stories become very meaningful to our kids. Like, I remember 
you know, growing up reading books like Anne of Green Gables, right, which is just full of so many virtues, like Bill Gladdy Dane, love and respect for orphans, respect for adults. I mean, it's just really, really um, an amazing, amazing book that formed my ideas of what it meant to be good, in a sense. But my parents were very disconnected from that text. They didn't really understand that. And so I think it's so powerful for me as a parent to even utilize the text that I read to read them with my kids and have conversations around things that are shared values versus things that might be foreign. So I know that if I talk to them about like Saudi, maybe in, the, in their formative years, <laughs> they weren't ready enough for that. But once they are, once they're cultivated that kind of taste for rich language, that's when we can kind of get them into, into this mode. So I think, mashallah, um, we can go into the, the habits that we can form in our homes, kind of, um, you know, maybe Sassarijan can go there, and then definitely once you guys have, um, you know, listen to these habits, if you have other suggestions of things that you've practiced, we'd love to hear from you as well, inshallah. All right, so with that, inshallah, pass it to you. <laughs> so, habits of learning. Uh, the first one, um, yeah, learning is a life along process. Uh, one thing that Sheikh Mohammed Yaqubi said, he said, if you want to, if you study two hours a day seriously, you become a scholar in ten years. So, it's consistency is the key to it. So, and then also, uh, how we study. This is a, a big problem now. There's, there's a we had a class with Shay and he said that there was a, someone wrote an article about a Robert Frost poem and you know two wrote divergent Elwood. And he said, Imagine he is in this beautiful forest and he goes and you see the split of the roads and this poem comes to him and he starts writing to and that okay, hold on. You think that he would finish that poem? I don't think so. Because your thoughts will go somewhere else. Like literally, it, it breaks your thought. And I, I mean, I don't write uh, poems. I used to write poems in Persian when I was younger, but I don't. Uh, I haven't written in years. But about seven, eight years ago, I was in Medina Munawar. I was sitting and I was doing some, you know, just just relaxing and, and the green, looking at the green dome. And I was there. I don't know how long. Maybe two, three, four hours. I lost track of time. And and this, just seeing how beautiful that green dome is. And and a poem came, like literally it came. I had my notebook, I took it out, I took a pen, and I started writing it down. I, it was just, I was trying to write as fast as it was coming before I forget. So I'm writing and I'm writing, and then this guy literally, some guy just put his face like between me and my notebook. And he's like, hey John. <laughs> I just like, yes. He said, you just start speaking, what is it? Is this a poem you're writing? And he's sitting next to me, he's like reading what I'm writing in Persian. What line? I said, yeah, I'm trying to write it. I swear, it's like the seven, it's six and a half lines and it's stuck there. I don't even, it just, it just blocked me right after that. But anyways, it's, you know, it will come to destruction and uh, the other stuff like she talked about it where really you have to have a place where you can study time. Uh, there are good times uh, for, for memorizing and studying. Now, why did Steve Jobs always wear the same clothes? Because he was poor, right? He didn't have any money. That's what, he <laughs> what about uh, Zuckerberg? Why did he wear the same clothes all the time? Just thought about it. So there's an article written why they do it. All, all of these people, they wear the same clothes every day. It's different, but it's the same clothes. So I have like 30 of the same t-shirt, 30 of the same pants. So it's just ready. They just put it on. Because the best idea in your head is in the morning when you wake up. And most people, they waste those great ideas on, what am I going to wear? Oh, does this much match with it? No, no, I'm going to put this, I'm going to put that. So all of those brilliant ideas goes into putting on clothing. So these guys have the same, so they have to think about, what am I going to wear tomorrow? It's the same thing I'm wearing every day of the week. And that's why they can come up with like really brilliant ideas or, you know, dangerous ideas, whatever it is that they believe in. So, really in the morning time is the best time to do memorization, to study. That's why a lot of the schools generally started after Fajr, they start studying and learning and reading and memorizing. By the time it hits evening, 
the brain doesn't have the same level of just like, you know, no matter how much coffee you drink, you're still not going to be able to have, like, you know, learning ability. Uh, the other thing is like a place where, you know, it depends on the person. So, for example, some of your kids are very disciplined. They can study even if the TV is on. Some, they're very sensitive. They can go, I can't study. Yeah. So we, we actually had this uh, exercise uh, at the school where my kids used to go. I don't want to mention their name. But <laughs> you mentioned their name. No, no, no. Anyway, so I knew that, that I told them, because I read this book, I said, put them, the, the, the students that they can't focus, put them in a place that there's nothing in the room. So this is just a white wall. So they're sitting here studying, and there's a there's nothing, just a white wall in front of them. Because some students, are, some kids are very sensitive, so you just have to create that environment so their mind doesn't go anywhere. Now imagine the students are sitting there doing their homework. The phone is like this, laptop is like this. Their uh, Instagram is popping up every second, and they're like, ah, okay, yeah, I'm doing this. Yes, I'll be there at seven p.m. Okay, how are they going to do anything? Like, how are they going to memorize anything, learn anything? Because the mind cannot be in two places at the same time. Like if, for the parents and for teachers and people who are interested in this subject, there's a beautiful book called uh, The Organized Mind by Daniel Levitin. And he's the same guy who wrote the book, uh, this, is your, this Is Your Brain on Music. But in this book, one of the things he talks about is that the way of... Uh, there's a... There's, there's a Technique in learning, and there's a time, the best times, the best space to learn, and uh, and also like how to uh, how to make the best out of out of your day because everybody has a different day schedule. Some people work at night; they come home and they're sleeping till two in the afternoon. So for everybody, it's different. It's not that it, you know. But one of the things that that he said, and I don't know if it's, it's here. We'll, we'll go to the library at uh, at the end. So, um, okay. One thing that he said was very interesting. He, he has a whole chapter on uh, on multitasking because I did multitasking all my life, and my wife is exact opposite of mine. She has she, until she doesn't finish one, she doesn't go to the next. That's the stuff. She was raised in Germany. I was raised in Afghanistan. That's the difference. So I was like, do this, do this, do everything at the same time. But I realized after reading that book that he is right because he's a neurosurgeon. He said. There is no way humanly possible that you can do two things at the same time and expect a result of 100% accuracy on both. It's impossible. Human being, you're going you to you're gonna make a mistake on one and it's going to be 50% here, 50 You're not there. You're not here, you're not there. And, and he said that you will never ever accomplish something uh, in a way that you're happy when you do multitasking. So one of the things that he said, he said, most people have a lot of stuff to do. So you have, let's say, you come home and you're like, oh my God, I don't mind, I give so much homework, right? So, what do you have? I have six homework, mama. What do you have? I have math, I have English, I have Arabic, I have this, I have that. Six homework? What do you have? You have like four hours to finish all this? Two hours? Whatever it is. So he said, divide them into, uh, say, okay, uh, math is going to take uh, about, what, 10 minutes? Yeah, 10 minutes. Science is going to take about 20 minutes. Arabic is going to take about 25 minutes. So he said, divide it into this one, two, three, four, five, six in levels. So what you would do, you would start with the easiest one and the shortest one. So, okay, not only let's get that. He said, the moment you finish it, there's a signal that's sent to the brain. Accomplished. Mission accomplished. Success. The boost of energy will come. So now the brain is active. Okay, we did one. Success, put it down. Next. So you just keep going. This is that has a ripple effect if you do that. A lot of the people, they start with, well, let me get rid of the hardest thing first and the longest thing. And they keep working, they keep working. It's like, oh my God, it's taking 45, I'm not done. And they, get, they, they won't do anything else. But start with the shortest and get things done. So that's a really good advice that he gives in that book. So going to number two, uh, the word but. Like, I, you know, like, it's a very good, you know, I want to, uh, you know, take this class, but, you know, this. The Prophet ﷺ said in the Hadith, he said, coulda, woulda, shoulda, is from Shaitan. Coulda done that, shoulda done that. You know, this is all from Shaitan. The Wasrasa, 
of shaitan. What's past you can't change, right? What's past you can't change. The future you have no control over. It. What you have in is in the present. Now, one of the things that you said that, you know, instead of saying, uh, I have to, you say, I want to. There was an article written about, I think they were from the barrier, or from Denver, I'm sorry. There was a family from India, uh, and I think they were Muslim, but it was on uh, uh, New, New York Times or one of those magazines. But I, I don't read the magazines, but when people send me articles, I do read it if it's interesting. So somebody sent me to read this. So they went from, uh, they, they were a corporate, they made money, they were there for like 10, 12 years, they had a couple of children in America. They, they sold their business, I don't know, four, six, eight million dollars, something like that, and they said, let's go back home and just live a comfortable life. So they left, and she said, in America, I hated the tasks daily. Oh my God, I have to pick the kids and take the kids. Okay, let's go kindergarten and drop them off. I have to go pick them up now. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to go get groceries. I have to. So when I went to India, she said, I had, she had like three kids. She said, I saw all of these children when I started driving them to school. All of these children walk into school. And it's 40 minutes walk, 45 minutes walk. All these kids like, you know, second graders, third graders, they're actually walking because their parents don't have a car. And then it, said, it hit her that a lot of the people in there, there's a couple that came and they said, hey, we've been married for so many years, we don't have any children. And she said that I changed my vocabulary from I have to do it, that I get to do this. Like, what a blessing that I, that I get to take my kids, I have children, that I have a car, that Allah has blessed me. He said, that changed my whole life. And I'm so happy now doing the same tasks. So it's all, as uh, Imam Nawi uh, mentioned that hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's all in the intention. So once you change your intention, you change your speech. Now, words have an effect on you, and this is why we, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawm al-akhir, fad yaqul khayran aw liyasmud. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day, they say things that are beautiful and good, or they keep silence. In other words, if you speak beautifully, you will actually become beautiful. And this is part of our tradition that Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said in Nahl al-Balagha that al-jamal al-rijal fi lisani that the beauty of a man is in his eloquence. So the more beautifully they speak, the more beautiful they will be. And this is why ulama, the scholars, because they have beauty in their language, they're all beautiful. Even though if you look at them, some of you say, you know what, that is not... There's nothing about them that make them beautiful. They're not like a model, but it, because of the eloquence of speech, they are actually very beautiful, mashallah. So, just not using those words, leave it to Allah, and you know, if you want to do something, do it, go for it. But you have to make sure, Rumi said that, you know, aim high, but also know your limit, because a hay cannot pick up a mountain. Aim high, but know your limit. A piece of hay cannot pick up a mountain. So everybody should know that, okay, I gotta aim high, but I gotta know what I can do, right? So for me, I can't say, oh, I'm gonna become the president of the United States. Because first of all, I wasn't born here, right? So that's right there is out of the right? So, like, these are things that you would know, like, oh, I'm gonna become like Mawlana Rumi. I, I can't even read his works until I, Died to finish reading the book. So, uh, so there's, there's after my limit. Everybody has to know their limit. So we have to be real. So, so cultivating rational thinking. So now, from a young age, one of the things that's easy to teach children is logic, and people think it's very hard because I have never seen any child who's not a master of logic. I swear to God. Like I used to be stuck when my kids were like in third grade. So I said, no, you can, why can we have it? Well, be, because, okay, hold on a second. Let me just think about this before I said, well, we're not going to have a console again. We're not going to have it. And my son was like, why? So because, you know, it's a waste of time. But my cousin has it, and his father is your brother. I'm like, okay, hold on. They have, you know, yes, he's my brother, and he, he allows it. But in my house, we don't allow it. 
and it also was a different year from the same parents. I swear, like he's at fourth grade, he's arguing with me why he can't have a console for his game. So they know logic more than we do, and that's why like a lot of the parents when they get upset at their children is because they don't know logic, <laughs> right? They, the fifth line is that you know logic in the beginning, but then if you don't practice it, you know we you don't build upon it. So they get angry and they say, because I said to they smack them back in the head, they say, because oh, you, you shouldn't. Alhamdulillah, I never smacked that kid. So that's why I tell them, I, say, I never smacked you, see? You better be nice. <laughs> so, so this is like, for example, you see something, uh, you see something, um, you can tell them logically that, okay, listen, don't look at this advertisement. It's haram. Like, in, because a lot of the things, look, we are living, like when I was in Pakistan, when, I, when we first moved to Pakistan from Afghanistan, it was a country, literally, it was like heaven on earth when you talk about Islam. Like, you didn't see anybody who was atheist. Like, I, like everyone from the rich to the poor, they were just sincere believers. I, I then in the masjid, everybody go to masjid. Whether they were rich, they were poor. Like the non-practicing, the Quran would recite. They would just, they would just grab something and put it on their head just to cover. <laughs> like they would not even have each other. Well, like it. I've seen it so many times. They would grab a tablecloth in a, in the wedding, and the moment you recite the Quran, they would put it on their. Now that is faith. That is iman. For those people, you can say, listen, don't do this. It's haram, my sister. It's halal. We are living in an age that right now in Pakistan, no island is talking about halal and halal. Why? Because people don't even believe. There are all this crazy young generation that they don't even believe. They now, you know what the fatwa is? That make sure that if you do a nikah and the man doesn't take his shahada, he can't do his nikah. Because people got married, they went home, and the girl is like, time to pray. Goes, oh, I don't believe in those stuff. That nikah is invalid. The guy doesn't believe in prayer. He's not a Muslim. So now they're making people, we are in a different time. Yes, you guys are in a bubble. This is, we live in a bubble, but outside of this is madness. So you have to be very careful that you have to have some type of logic to teach them that, okay, this is wrong based on this. This is right. You know, one of the taboo subjects that people don't talk about, but unfortunately, uh, uh, you end up counseling these people who are addicted to pornography in the Muslim community. But nobody wants to talk about it. You know, Sheikh Hamza talked about this. 12 years ago at RS, and they, they never, they didn't produce the thing that it's too out there, but like, wallahi, after the talk, a woman came and she cried and said, thank you for talking about this because my husband is addicted and he's Imam of a Muslim. So, and this is over a decade ago. Imagine now. So, there are, and Pamela Paul wrote that book, Pornified, when she was there, on the stage, Bishy Hamza talking about this subject, doing a statistic of this foul thing in the Muslim countries. Yeah. Three of the top, uh, uh, three of the top five countries for download are Muslim countries. In that time. So now it's probably even worse. So you have to be really uh, connected and knowing like what's going on in the world. So being really uh, logical with the children, uh, understanding and then not screaming and shouting says, that's how it is. It's, it's, because you have to be able to explain to them where they are happy with your answer. And this one thing he said, you said Nasser said, it was very brilliant. He said, they asked him, he, he, he so one of the things that you said Nasser said uh, about you know, when ISIS was introduced, he said, we had a generation of people when they came in and the boy would ask his father, uh, who has created us, he said, Allah, and then you say, who created Allah? And then he would say, oh, you become a kafir, shut up, and then he would smack it on top of his head. And then he said, Baba, uh, you know, you said Allah sits on the throne, and yeah, how does he sit on the throne? Uh, just smack him on the head. Oh, Baba, uh, you say Allah has a hand, Ya Allah, but what kind of hand he has? Is like my hand? Smack him on the back, because he, the father didn't have the answer. He didn't know how to teach the child. He said, what happened, then another group came in, and then they have the AK-47 in it. These are the same children that grew up. And when people say something, oh, you say something against Allah, I'm going to shoot you. So it starts from a young age 
that you actually teach them these, and these are not hard stuff to learn. It's not that it's impossible. Any parent can learn this stuff to, to uh, make sure to tell their children in a way that they're satisfied. Now, time. People say, I don't have time. Shaykh Hamza said, this is the greatest lie human being has ever said, I don't have time. Because the only thing we have is time. We just don't have time management. That's all. So, the Quran says, Pu anfusikum ahlikum. Save yourself and your family. This is the order. Save yourself and your family. And then, and then, and then. This is the sequence. You know, Sheikh Muhammad Yaqub said the first time he flew internationally, he came on a flight, he said, they said, when, in case of emergency, the oxygen mask will come down. First, put it on yourself. Then help the person next to you if they need help. He said, that is Islam. Because a beggar cannot give up. If you don't have any money, how are you going to help somebody else, right? So you have to make sure that you take care of yourself. So what I call is me time. Me time is time for yourself. We always spend time for our children, for our parents, for our friends, for our school, for our whatever it is. But do you spend time with yourself? Do you get 15 minutes a day for yourself? 20 minutes a day? Generally, they say if you don't spend an hour a day for yourself, you're not living. I don't call it life. It's miserable. But at least it starts with 15 and go to 30. And those are things that make you happy. Because if your spirit is down, then you're going to bring that negative energy on your children, on your parents, on your friends, on your school, in the classroom. It's all going to be negative. Why? Because you didn't spend enough time with yourself. You didn't do something that you, whatever it is. I have a friend, he just sent me a video from Las Vegas. Good guy. Convert. He found this thing. It's, it's, it, he's an African American convert. Guess what his thing is? Persian flute. That's his thing. He said, this gives me happiness. He just plays flute. Every day. He said, I play one hour a day. And he said, every week, he said, you know, I learned this new thing. He loves Maulana. So, everybody has something. I like to do a walk and be away from everybody going to this place behind our house that you can't even see any human being or cars or anything. It's just in a jungle, basically. That's what I like to do. Some people like to go in a corner, sit, and read a book. And whatever. Some people want to put the headphone and listen to Afasi reading. Surah Yasin. You have to find what makes you happy. It's me time. I'm, you're not, don't, you know, Ruby said, come as you are when you come to God. Don't put filters on. Don't put on, you know, like, oh, I have, oh, for my me time, I like to read Dostoevsky's, you know, Crime and Punishment. Because, don't be intellectual. If that's your thing, then read it. But if that's not your thing, you're not enjoying it, don't read it. Maybe you want to read a comic book. Whatever you like. Maybe you want to read a little bit of Iqbal, or read, you know, Rumi, or whatever it is, or a children's book. What, or not read. Or you want to sit there, oh, one of my friends, his thing is Sunset. He drives, he's like 10 minutes away from my house at Sunset, he just, this is my time. I just like watching the Sunset, bring you tranquility, relax, I go home with full of energy. Find that thing that gives you energy, that makes you positive, that makes you happy. It's your time, it doesn't have to be with anybody. You, it can be with people that you love if you want, you know, sometimes you want to take your kid or something, that's fine. But as long as it's your time, something that you enjoy. enjoy. And then family time, it's very important. Daily is very hard. And the reason why it's hard is because of the work schedule, that every day you have a time. Those who can do it, this is the best thing you can do. 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, after Maghrib, after Isha, after Fajr, after Dhuhr. Find the time that everybody's home and free at that time. So that is, is done. So, or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, whatever, or at least Saturdays, or Fridays, or something where you sit, and it's family time. Let's sit down. Okay, let me tell you a story. Depending on the age, you tell the stories of the Sahaba, the Prophet, of this, of that. So you share something, and then you ask them, so what do you think about that? Always engage your children. You'll be shocked the amount of uh, uh, what you get from them. So studying a second language or expanding the scope, uh, scope of your knowledge. So, you know, Jim Rohn said that, you know, his life, he always, he wanted to work at a, he was working at a corporation, he was doing things that make the corporation better. Right? I got to work overtime, I can do this. 
He said, I mean, at one point I said, hmm, why don't I just do things to make myself better? So he said, I start learning another language. Then I start reading books to expand my knowledge about, I want to learn about science, I want to learn about technology, I want to learn about human nature, I want to learn about grammar, I want to learn about this. So start reading me time for me, right? And that's where he became like this, you know, a uh, guru for a lot of people uh, and a billionaire, but because he spent more time making himself better than making the corporation better. So spend more time making yourself better, uh, whatever it is. If you're not reading daily, you're missing out in life. I, I don't even know how people do. Like some homes I go and there's no books, I get suffocated. Like I literally get suffocated. Because sometimes the conversations are not really something you can just grab a book and just go into the world. Uh, but there are books, there are homes that have no books, which is, you know, I mean, I call it hell. Like, I, I didn't want to go there. So you have to have books. We'll get back to the library at the end and parts of it. So this one is the small acts that are constant, right? And that's very important to do. Look. There's a beautiful Persian proverb that says, Tuni ki mi kuni dar dajlandos ki izet dar biyavon at dahadmos. He said, when you do a good action, it's like a cup of water that you throw into the ocean. That's your action for God. Okay, I did an action. You threw a cup of water into the ocean. Okay, did it increase or decrease the ocean with that action? I'm sorry, no. It's, it, there's, it's insignificant. So, but what happens when you are stranded in a desert, dying of thirst, Allah will send that cup of water back to you. That's the secret of a small action, that because you did it for Allah, Allah will make it priceless, even though it's worthless. That cup of water into the ocean is worthless, but it becomes priceless in that moment that you're dying of thirst, that you will give your entire life for a cup of water, Allah will send that to you. So don't think that, oh, it's a small thing. The reason why it's not small is because you're doing for Rabbul Alameen. Right? The reason why it's not small is because you do it for Allah. And obviously we talked about one thing at a time and not doing multitasking. So, conversation. A lot of the places that you go now, especially if you're from you know subcontinent of Anasan, the conversation in households are literally, if you have any aql, you're suffocating. Because it's all about nonsense. It's about, he said, she said, you went to that wedding, what she was wearing, have you seen this drama, have you seen this movie, you know, ah, oh, you bought that new car, you got that new thing. It's all about things of the world that, you know, really has no benefit, zero. So there's not, you know, like I, you know, I always said, tell my wife, I said, you know, like, like we don't get a lot of visitors in our house, and when they come in, they just leave really fast, because for them it's kind of like, what the heck is going on there? I, first of all, I tell them, I said, you're entering backbiting. Like, everything you're saying is backbiting. Just stop. Like, literally stop, please. So, uh, uh, it's better not to have guests over that get you into backbiting, get you into things that are haram. Uh, so, that's that's the best way to do it. But, uh, unfortunately, it is um, Silat al-Alham, you know, just Silat al-Alham, so you have to Say that the Rahmi have to have it for some family members and visiting, but make it as quick and as efficient as possible. And try to start teaching your children from a young age the family, especially. Uh, I just someone I can write a book about how to raise children. It's called All the Mistakes I Made Raising Children. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah, we didn't make, and it's not the mistake, it's the things we could have done that we didn't do. Those are the things that, you know, when you send your kid to Islamic school, and this is a very good school because this is a Homaira. You know, Sister Afra and all of you, the, the teachers here, are beautiful, um, and they do. But they would tell you; they'd be the first to tell you that you have to give them supplemental learning because they, there's no way that school can do everything. Teach them math, teach them akhlaq. Teach them. It's impossible. Like you have to just come to that. You got. You can't just. Okay, I'm done. Eight years later, my daughter, my son has to be perfect. I'm sorry, if you're expecting that, this is not paradise, and these are, they're not uh, prophets or robots that they can, you know, reprogram uh, everything. So you, the house, you have to really have gathering at the house, where you talk, you have a system of teaching, that they have to learn. 
look, you don't have to learn, you know, you know, we had some stuff I thought of in the game, formal logic. You don't have to learn, you know, uh, master Aqidah of Tahawiyah. You don't have to learn, you know, Dalim al-Hadith and be a Muhaddith and be a Mufassir. No. Just put in the heart of your children the love of Allah and His Messenger. Anyone can do that. Just tell them their stories. Just tell them short stories. Their story about the Prophet. So from a young age of the awliya, like I would do a story before they go to sleep until they were like, until they kicked me out of their bed. Like literally there was a time they said, nah, boy, don't come, you know. I'm like 15 or 14. Now. But I would go and I would tell them stories and of the awliya and of the Prophet Salaam. And just like, just to spend time like with your kids, you know. So tell them stories and just, and then the second thing, constant reminder of Torah. Essential to do these two things. That, hey, we make mistakes, we're human beings, but you can make talk Allah forgives. Constantly remind you, Allah forgives you. When you go to Allah, just ask for forgiveness. Just Allah will forgive you. Anything you do, you made a mistake, uh, just go, don't even tell your parents. Go to Allah first. Make sure you go to Him. You, you, and that is, that was the essential part of our faith when we grew up. That was essential. Like I grew up, like Toba was at the foundation of what, what I was taught in the house. And that really helped me because when I was lost in the West, I did, if I didn't have that teaching that I could come out of this madness that I'm in and Allah will forgive me, I would have never came out. I can ask her husband, like we, we went to college together. <laughs> I would have never came out of that because there's no, then I knew that Allah will forgive if I make Toba. So a lot of the people, a lot of the young people, the reason why when they start sinning and get disobeying Allah, they don't come back because they don't know Tawbah. And nobody told them about the Remind them from constantly and tell them the stories. There's a beautiful book called Kash, Kash al It's translated in English as well. And it has all the stories of those people who make Tawbah and become holy of Allah. Tazkiratul Awliya of Faridina Taught is translated in English to a selection of it. There's a lot of books about tell the story of those people who made Tawbah and they become saints of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's in the back of their head. So when they make the mistake, they know how to rectify it and come back. So uh, one of the things that I really would love to see uh, is no music in a car. Um, Alhamdulillah, I, I, I stopped listening to music like, I don't even know how long ago. Like, I, I don't even know who's, who are the singers. My, the singers of the West that I know is Michael Jackson. So he was like, what? So yeah, that's the last person I listened to. So uh, I, I just don't know who's who. Um, don't play music in your car unless it's an Ashid. Now, I gotta say one thing though. If you're gonna put your children to learn something like music, send them into classical piano. I know that some people might have different opinion on these stuff, but what happens when they learn classical piano, and I know a few people who did that, they will not listen to pop music. They will not listen to this music because the pop music today is all is is it's haram because it's all foul words. There's no there's no clean pop music anymore. It's all rap music, heavy metal, everything has foul words. So you can you can't listen to those things. But if they are doing classical piano, they will go in that Mozart and Beethoven and they're listening to classic. They can't even listen to these things. So at least their ears are protected from the haram. So that's something you can do. So don't uh, don't uh, and drive. Don't have music unless even if it's Sam Yusuf or Mahir Zain and these artists. They're good, especially for young kids to memorize those songs. There's a lot of beautiful songs. The song the Nine Nine Names of Allah that they can as matter of fact, I memorize the Nine Nine Names of Allah uh, with that song in the sequence because I couldn't do the sequence. I memorized the 25 names of the prophets with a song that a Turkish Mustafa Gulish Dukhdo, he did this, and you know, Adam, Idris, Nuhon, Walutun, Salish. So it's, it's just, but it's a rhythm, and you can memorize it in sequence all the way to the Prophet, the 25th Prophet. So, anyway, that I'll mention in the Quran. So, uh, dinner time, you can talk during dinner, obviously, good thing. The only thing you can't talk that's prohibited by religion is death. So, don't talk about death during dinner. 
uh, or doing food because it's not prohibited. You, uh, you're supposed to lose your appetite when you talk about death. So that's the reason, like, how could you like eat and talk about it? It becomes, it's supposed to be something really to wake you up. So, uh, in 10, uh, yeah, we talked about this. Wow, I'm done, I know. Beneficial counsel. Okay, I talked about that. Beneficial literature. You so I'll read and then you do your thing. So literature, there's a lot of beneficial literature in every language. Uh, this is probably the greatest book that you can, in the Western civilization that you can teach, learn, and teach your children. Uh, obviously, this is not for little kids. Uh, when did your daughter read this? Like, what, what age? What, uh, maybe eighth grade? Yeah, but she's ahead of her time. So, she got, <laughs> so I would say like, 10th grade would be like a good time to start this, like, you know, for the average person. Some people in 11th, 12th grade, honestly. Some people like first year of college. But if, you're, if your kids are like, martial arts more, they read a lot, it's good to start like, you know, 9th grade. Like when you start high school, it'd be good. This, but a lot of these you can teach your children in a basic language and tell them like, they don't have to learn the four level of reading. Just teach them the first level. They need to be there. just learn the first level. This is how it is. You know, your eyes are moving. Put your finger. So there's a lot of technique that he teaches you in this uh, in this book. Um, I've This is also the beginning of the of college. This is part of the curriculum in yeah. freshman year. So it's a really nice book. It's a beautiful book. Um, my daughter's reading it now. I gave it to her two years ago to read. So she's reading it now. But, uh, that's good. Better late than never. So. In any case, uh, there's a lot of literature in English language. The classics are beautiful. Uh, that you can read. Like, you know, some people might have different opinions on this issue, like The Great Gatsby, Catcher in the Rye, all of those books. You know, like we read it in high school, and I still remember it had an impact on me. Billy um, uh, Budd, all those, all those books are really good in, in the English literature. Now, for parents who are readers. I would highly recommend people who read novels, because a lot of people read novels. If you're reading novels, do not read modern novels. It's a waste of your time. You'll regret it. Because the thing about novels is you can't get it out of your head. That's the problem with novels. Once it enters your head, you can't get it out. It's, there, it's like pop songs, right? Shakespeare, the reason why they keep pop songs is because they keep popping in your head. <laughs> but I went to a... Uh, uh, where was I was in, in Toronto and I went to this restaurant and they were playing 80s music. And every every line I had it memorized. I'm like, can you stop please? It's driving me nuts. Uh, so anyways, good literature. Yeah. I think they're gonna start prayer. Okay, let's go pray. Pray and then come back for a question and answer, inshallah. Okay.